Okay, should have started. Okay, now it's starting to record. So welcome to Strategic Publishing. Um, I hope you guys learn a lot and yeah, we'll get started. So before we officially start, I'd like to recognize and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting and pay respects to elders, both past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I'm in Sydney at the moment and I am on Gadigal land. So strategic publishing is uh, one of the parts in the research process, which is very important. Um, when you are ready to publish and you have finished your manuscript or your research or any kind of work that you have been working on, you really need to think about where you want to publish. Now, this presentation focuses on strategic publishing. But notice how I've done a little gradient in the research cycle there. Um, strategic publishing impacts your promotion and it also impacts measuring your impact. Um, and what you can see here is that we will be talking mostly about strategic publishing, but I will also be touching on promoting your research and how strategic publishing can help. And I will be slightly touching on measuring your impact because it is all interlinked. I'd also like to note that there will be a session on metrics and measuring your impact right after this session. The details will be at the end of this session. So if you'd like to go to that, um, you can. And I encourage you to, it's going to be a fantastic session. Okay, so this is what we're going to be talking about. So publication, promote and measure. We're going to give you tools and advice to help you to decide where to publish, um, your author identity management and different ways for um, assessing for success. Okay. And this is our advice to you. We will talk about each aspect through this um, presentation. We'll be talking about aiming high, making your research available, findable, and we're also going to touch on predatory publishing, um, as well as ORCIDs, DOIs, reaching different audiences and looking for different kinds of impact. So first off, aiming high. Um, where you publish matters. It matters because some journals are of higher quality, wider readership, and it holds some weight in your research, okay? And this would naturally lead to our next point. How do I judge what a high impact journal is? And the way to do that is through journal metrics. Now, journal metrics are a measure of quality, which is based on citations. They are a proxy measure for a journal's importance in the field because presumably, researchers will cite high quality research more frequently. So we assume that the more citations those, journal gets, those journals get, the more important the journal is for that field. Um, the better quality of research, the greater the research, the readership, sorry. Metrics will often come in form of a score, which tells you on average how many citations an article published in that journal will attract. As you can see, um, there are a variety of metrics available which are calculated using different data sources and may or may not be normalized to take into the account the citation habits of the field. And what that means is the citation habits of the field is um, different fields of research will have different citation um, habits. So for example, in STEM subjects, particularly health and science, um, traditional citations um, practices are usually done unlike the arts where there might be different citation practices. So that's what field normalized means. And we need to take that into account. Um, more of the general metrics will also be explained in our metric session coming up. So the key takeaway is though that there are a variety of metrics and you should use more than one because it will tell a story. Another thing to add that it's actually about context and not the scores that are important, okay? So here we have journals which are ranked by a metric called SJR, the Scamago Journal Rank. It is field normalized and weighted, so citations received from a prestigious journals are worth more. 
You can read off each of the scores to get an idea of an average prestige for each article, but it's more meaningful when you view the rankings according to discipline. Okay, so here are the rankings for nursing right here, as you can see over here. Well, Psychiatry is the top nursing journal and it's got an SJR of 15.5. However, if you look at the rankings for community and home care for, and the top journal is public health reviews, the SJR is only 1.6, okay? The scores for these journals, the ones at the bottom right here, are naturally going to be lower because you're looking at a subdiscipline, so a smaller, more specialist grouping of research. If you look at the scores alone, so comparing 15.5 to 1.6, um, it's not going to tell much of a story. You might think that these journals are lower impact. However, both are also Q1 journals, right here. Okay, which means they're at the top 25% of their field and sub-discipline respectively. Now I'm gonna show you a demonstration on how to uh, find this information. Um, so just bear with me while I escape <laughs> and show you how to do this. So a simple Google search for SJR will come up, okay? And we're gonna go into, you can search a journal um, on its own if you like. For example, the example that we use. I hope I spelled that right. <laughs> and it comes up and you can go and look into the journal metrics here. And as you can see my online shopping habits, I apologize. <laughs> but um, there's our, Q1 journals. You can also go back into the home page and go into journal ranking. And here we have all the journals. So this shows you all subject areas with your SJR and the top journals in the world at the moment. However, we can go through subject areas. Let's just, for example, go into arts and humanities. And our top journal is this, the Administrative Science Quarterly at 17.35. It's a Q1 journal. But then we can also go into subcategories, um, into the classics. Let's see what turns up. Ancient philosophy. The comparison between the SJR score itself is miles apart, but it's still a Q1 journal which means if you were writing a paper or some kind of research in ancient philosophy and that's part of this field, this would be a great place to publish in because it is at the top of their field, despite it being, um, despite it being you know, a smaller SJR score. You can also have a look by region as well, if you would like. At the end of the day, it really depends on what you want from your research. If you want to go into a more broader journal, you can, if you need to, if that's your aim for your research. Okay. And going back in. Can you all see the slide again? Yes, okay, cool. Moving on. The next thing you should look at is your journal um, scope. If your paper doesn't fit into the journal scope, then it will not be accepted. Um, it helps to think about audience as well, like I mentioned before. Does your topic have a broad appeal that a broad range of readers will be interested in? Meaning that you can consider titles that focus on multidisciplinary um, aspects of your research or does it require a specialist knowledge to understand meaning that you will need to target journals with a narrower scope okay there are tools that are designed to help you discover journals that might have a suitable scope and can be good to bring to your attention to options that you might not necessarily have been aware of um, a lot of publishers products can be useful for providing details like acceptance rates and time to publicate uh, times of publication so some 
tools are journal author name estimator, so Jane. Elsevier journal finder is one, Springer journal suggester is another one, and manuscript matcher by EndNote. Um, these are all available via Google as well. And all you would have to do is just copy and paste the abstract of your paper into them, and it comes up with a list of suggestions. Um, I chose to focus on manuscript matcher today only because, you know, we provide the library provides all students and researchers and staff with EndNote, and it comes with um, our subscription to it. If you Google EndNote Manuscript Matcher, you'll find it very easy to um, use. And in fact, you should also have it in your Word if you have EndNote um, installed onto your, onto your computer. It will only work if you've been using EndNote for your citations though, okay? Otherwise, you can use the online version and copy and paste your abstract in as well. Okay, so the next step is making your research available. And in this step, we'll be focusing on open access publishing. Now, open access publishing removes price barriers, subscriptions, licensing, licensing fees, and pay-per-view fees, and, all, like, and permission barriers, most copyright and licensing restrictions. It means that anyone can view your research um, through the internet and there's no paywall. So um, your article will reach a wider, uh, a wider audience. Some of the drivers for open access publishing is government grants, um, NHMRC and ARC requirements. Um, it is a requirement that you publish open access. So it's something you should consider. And also there has been a push um, towards open access publishing as well. And it's just a great way of publishing because it means that your research is reaching more people and making a bit more social impact. A bit of open access glossary before we get started. Um, there are some terms that we use during open access um, publishing. Um, one of them is open access models, which I'll explain on the next slide. Um, another is article processing charges that you might have heard of. So it's an APC and it's usually a fee charged by the publisher to an author to make your work open access. So this means that it will, uh, the, the fee that you pay pays for making your research available, all the indexing, all of that stuff and the formatting and making sure that your, that your work is available to everyone. That's what that fee usually covers. Another term that you might hear with an open access is embargo periods. It's a period of time after an article that has been published and can be made as open access. What that means is that sometimes when you publish, you can't make your article open access straight away. And this would depend on the publisher and the journal that you publish in. Um, embargo periods are usually six to 12 months. Okay, so our open access models. Here we have three open access models. Our first open access model is green open access. And it allows the author to keep the non-commercial rights to their article. So it can be posted in an open internet archive, such as your institutional repository. And there is an embargo period of six to 12 months. An example is the Lancet. So what that means is when you submit your article into a green open access, the non-commercial rights, so the article before it's been sent to your publisher and they format it to make it look like a part of their journal, that pre-published version can be put into an institutional archive, into, into the institutional repository, but you would have to wait six to 12 months for it to become open access via the institutional repository. Um, the embargo periods might depend, might be longer, might be a little bit shorter, depending on the publisher again. Next, we have your hybrid or hybrid gold open access. This is when one or more articles in a journal is open to anyone on the internet, even though the rest of the content is um, only available to people with paid subscriptions. Um, and you need to pay an APC for this one as well. An example is nature. 
And then there's pure open access, so gold open access. Journals in which all articles and content are open access, available to anyone on the internet without any subscription fees or sign in, you will need to pay an APC for this one as well. And an example would be PLOS One. Do you have any questions regarding our open access models yet? No. How much is an APC? Uh, that would depend on the publisher actually. Um, and that's something you would need to contact the publisher for to find out. And you can sometimes find it on their websites as well. Does CDU have support for this? Yes, they do. I will touch on that in a bit, Alison. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I'm gonna show you how to find your open access journals and how to figure out what type of open access it is and what you need and the publication process for some of these open access journals. Now there are two websites which you can do this on, which is DOASH, so the Directory of Open Access Journals, and also Sherpa Romeo. Um, these are two very great websites which you can you know, use to find which journals you would like to publish on and find out how those um, journals function. Just going to go back in and, you know, Google works um, is the best way to find Doage. And we're gonna go into Sherpa Romeo as well by Google. Okay, and this is what they look like. Here's this is a journal that I've selected and let's just go into search. You can just click here and it'll take you to this. And there you go. Different journals would, of course, have different policies, and you just need to look them up. Um, so this journal here, Web Ecology, um, no publication fees, but it's an open access in 2000. You can see what their CC license is and all their open access statements and terms and conditions and how much uh, copyright you retain as well. Okay. You can go into Sherpa and Romeo directly from here. They often have the link or you can just search it there. I'll just click here so I don't have to type it up again. And you go in. And here's all the publisher policy. And it tells you if there is an embargo period, if there's any fee involved. And the different versions you can submit. Some journals will have like published version A, published version B, published version, version C, and that would depend by the license. It's how much you're willing to give up of your license and of your copyright. So there's different policies for different journals, just a FYI. A great thing about Sherpa Romeo is if you go back in, you can even browse. So browse by publisher rather than just journal name. Let's just say you wanna go into Wiley. We're going to that one or that one, whatever you choose. Sorry, it's taking some time. There we go. And you can have a look at all the journals that Wiley publishes. Okay. Let's just choose this one. And you can have a look. So 
like I said, there's a pathway C, pathway B, pathway A. Um, and it tells you if you need a fee or not and how much of your copyright you can keep. Okay. Oops. Moving forward, so we as a university at CDU have free open access publishing. Um, these have been negotiated by CORL, which is the Council of Australian University Libraries. And as a member, we have negotiated free open access publishing, which is with little barriers like no embargo periods and article processing charges. Um, and we have agreements with CSIRO Publishing, Cambridge University Press, Bringer Nature, Oxford University Press and Wiley. If you would like more information on this, there is a libguide that we have created for you. Feel free to scan it. Um, and it will take you to this page where it will explain this in depth and give you details on who to contact about them, okay? As for um, details and more information on APCs, we do have uh, help for CDU researchers. There are conditions um, to receiving the, that kind of help um, in terms of your article processing charge. To find out more, um, do visit the RIS landing page for researchers. Um, there is a section on there called open access. And uh, if you scan that, it will take you straight to their page and uh, it'll tell you the process of applying for those APCs and how to get that funding. Okay, I'll just give you some time if you wanted to copy down the URL or go into the website. Okay, moving forward. One of the reasons um, we publish open access is that openly accessible research gives you a citation advantage. Okay. And in most cases, anyway, it would also give your research a boost in attention. Consider if groups of people outside of academia would be interested in your research, such as professionals, policymakers, and the general, general public. What we use to measure engagement is a tool called, called Outmetric. And this is the Outmetric dashboard for an open access article about alcohol use and burden. If your article is open access, more people can act, um, have a look at it. More people would be able to read it. And this would increase your attention score that you can see here. This article has been mentioned in 326 news stories and has been referenced on Wikipedia five times. This is good to know because it means you have an audience beyond academia who are interested in and engaging with your research. And a large part is because people can actually access and read the article because it is open access. Okay. Now, CDU does not have institutional access to Altmetrics yet, but in the meantime, you can use a toolbar, which I'll show you in a bit, um, and add it to your bookmarks. And there's another QR code that you can scan or just go into. Um, that URL, or you can even just um, Google Outmetric free tools and it'll come up. And the Outmetric tool, the free tool, looks a bit like this. Okay. And every time you go into an article, that's, it will, this will show up. If you click on the bookmark, this will, the metric session will go more into depth on how to do this as well. Our metrics is one way of measuring alternative metrics, um, social impact and all that stuff, but also Plume X via Scopus as well does this. If you go into the metrics section of an article and click Plume X, it'll give you all of this information as well. Okay, moving forward, predatory publishing. So what is predatory publishing? So in an online environment, there are predators, we all know this, and they have taken 
advantage of this uh, digital publishing world that we have created. <laughs> And it's generally motivated by profit. So what that means, there might be some publishers out there that really don't follow standards. They don't have a proper peer review process and they're just pretending to be a legitimate publisher. Okay. Um, and most, a lot of the times they can seem like legitimate publishers. So they, that's where you need to be careful. Now, some funding bodies are paying for publication costs associated with making articles open access to, to um, make sure that you don't end up publishing in predatory journals. Um, because when you do get some kind of help from the university or your research in institution for APC funding, um, they will look into where you are publishing and that's kind of a, a way to stop you from publishing in a predatory journal. So more commercial op opportunity is more exploitation, unfortunately. We have an amazing website here called thinkcheck-submit.org. And if you go into it, there is a checklist that you can follow um, to make sure they, um, the journal you have chosen is not an open access, um, is not a predatory journal, sorry. Um, this checklist, do, do recommend using things like I've showed you, like Doage, um, Sherpa Romeo, to figure out if the journal is legitimate as well. So do have a look. It's thing, checksubmit.org. You can also Google this and it'll come up. When you have chosen your journals, it is best to ask yourself, you know, do your colleagues know, know the journal? Have you read articles? Um, is it indexed in the database that you use? So on and so forth. Do you recognize the editorial board? Can you easily Google for this information? So it's really a good idea to, to do some detective work on the journal that you have chosen. Um, and like I said, Doage and Sherpa Romeo is a great place to find um, out if a journal is not, is predatory or not. Yeah. Here's a great article that you can read, predatory journals, what they are and how to avoid them. It's, it, it states out a list, uh, a much larger list than what I've given you on, you know, how to identify them and like, as the title suggests, how to avoid them. There have been cases where people have published in predatory journals, if you just do a Reddit, believe it or not, a Reddit search about the experiences of researchers um, publishing in predatory journals, it is really sad, unfortunately. <laughs> so like, it's always good to be well-informed and get the help that you need to identify them. Okay. And the next thing is, is you need to make your research findable. OK, and what that means is to make sure that you have your indexing, um, you have chosen a journal that is indexed in the place that you want it to be in. So it's worth looking up which database will index your journal, and you can do that by using a directory called Ulrichs, which is available through the library website. I'll also show you how to do this. So you might ask yourself, how can I get my article into PubMed? Um, it's the other way around. If you want to get your article into PubMed, you need to publish in a journal which is indexed by PubMed. So every database has indexing rules, which are decide which decide what content um, content appears in the database. And these rules relate to subject matter, scope, and quality, um, especially in medicine and the health sciences, where most searching is done in the database. And I'm going to show you right now how to get into Ulrichs. We're gonna go into library search, database, Ulrichs, there we go. Just let it sign in. Now I'm gonna do Apology here as well, the example that we used. And it's right there. And you can see details about that journal. 
including they even give you the link and abstracting and indexing so you can have a look where this journal is being indexed we'll look there so super handy this tool you can also look at other things like the subjects um, the classification but most of these you would have already done in your research through um, Doage and Sherpa Romeo anyway. So that's how you can kind of use all these three tools together. Yeah, I can show you where to find Ulrichs again, sure. So you just go back into the library website. Okay. Databases. You and Ulrich's periodical directory, and it'll take you in. Okay, sweet. All right, some other tips effective titles are short, straightforward, and reflect, uh, reflect how people will search for your paper. Um, effective abstracts are clear, accurate, use synonyms, include multiple keywords and consider readers from non-English speaking backgrounds as well. Um, and author keywords, use as many relevant author provided keywords as possible, considering the general and specialized vocabulary of your audience is likely to use. Make sure you include variations of language and phrasing and consider commonly used acronyms with, within editorial guidelines. Okay. So that's done with our publication section of our um, presentation. Do we have any questions? No, all good. Okay, so moving on, we're going to go into promote. And this is the outreach part of the workflow. And in addition to promoting your research, this is about how making sure that you as a researcher are findable. So not only does your work need to be findable, you need to be findable as well. Orchid. Now, you should, if you don't already have one, you should get yourself an Orchid ID. And an Orchid ID are permanent identifiers for researchers. And the key benefit of an Orchid ID is to eliminate author disambiguation. And it links to Scopus, Web of Science, and other databases. Okay. Orchid allows you to identify all your publications and get proper attribution. It's like an online CV. You can add it to your email signature, conference presentations, grant applications, um, and you be in control of your online presence and use it to engage with your discipline online, not just offline. So, Alison, was that how do you find your Orchid? Is that what you mean? Yes. Okay. So you actually have to sign up for an ORCID and I'll, I'll show you in a bit. So this is what an ORCID profile looks like. Okay. More or less. That is a unique identifier. These digits right here. Um, it's something that is just for you. And on an ORCID profile, you can put your work, you can put all your publications, uh, uh, where uh, you've been employed, and all the grants that you have received, so on and so forth. And I will show you right now. And I'm going to actually show you an awkward profile, my one. Even though it doesn't really have much on it because I have not published anything, but this is what it will look like. You can sign in and register through here. Okay. When you do register, register, you will register with your CDU email, of course, but then you can go into your settings and then add in another email, so your personal email. And you do that because just in case you end up changing institutions and you have you no longer have access to your CDU email, okay? And I've signed in. And this is my ORCID profile. I don't have any publications. Like I said, I haven't published anything. But you can put your works here, all your membership to your different 
whatever it could be. It could be like a research society if you wanted to put that in, all your funding information. So it's like a really good online CV. Okay, and notice how I've got my um, personal email there as well. Okay, so this is what you would look like. All you simply do is just sign up to your ORCID ID. And when you do publish, um, or when, you're, uh, when you do publish, your publisher will most likely ask for your ORCID ID as well. So one of the reasons we do have an awkward ID, like I've mentioned before, is to make sure that you are not confused with other people. And also you don't end up having multiple profiles um, for your research. So notice here in this example, now I can't show you a live example of this anymore because the profiles have been merged and fixed, but here is an example that we found. Um, a researcher by the name of um, Stephen Garnett, he's got three profiles, okay? And what can happen is if, if, if these profiles aren't put together and because there is a lack of ORCID ID, um, is that when we come to measuring your impact through Cybal or even Scopus here, is that your metrics will be inaccurate, could be inaccurate. This is a less severe example of author disambiguity. Sometimes it can happen with someone from a completely different university and a completely different person as well. Okay, and we don't want that to happen to make sure that your metrics are all mixed up and something's been published under someone else's name by pure accident. Um, those things can be fixed. So if it has happened to you, um, it can be it, it, it can be fixed. So, so don't worry about it. <laughs> too much, but to make sure that the process is more steam, um, streamlined, you would use an ORCID ID to make sure that it doesn't happen very often. Okay. Some other research profiles is Google Scholar, your CDU faculty and then your HDR profiles, if you have any. Um, you can also get academia.edu and ResearchGate as well, if, if you prefer. Okay. And these are all things that you just sign up for via Google. Just go into their websites and click sign up. Now, DOIs, digital object identifiers. Um, these are very important because they will make sure that everything is linked and it'll make sense in a bit when I show you at the end why you would need a DOI for your work. As most of our work is online, a DOI is a unique identifier which provides a persistent link to identify your publication. So it's consistent and that is the key word, okay? Um, it's because URLs can be broken and that's why DOIs are minted. And a DOI doesn't get lost, okay? Your audience can always access your work even when it's moved to another site as well, okay? So maybe if not for journals, if you have a DOI for, um, let's just say you're an architecture research and you have made this amazing plan and you've minted a DOI with it, if you wanted to move it to another website, it won't it won't get lost in the internet highways, okay? It, because you have that DOI, anyone can find it even if another website goes missing or another URL is created, okay? And like I mentioned, it's permanent. The impact of your work can also be measured through any kind of outmetric. A DOI, if your DOI is there, it can measure, outmetric can measure it. And you can get a DOI from your institutional repository. CDU does mint DOIs and I will tell you how to do that in a moment. So here's an example of a DOI. Um, that's what it looks like. Sometimes it only has the numbers at the end, like after the forward slash. So what will happen is sometimes, even if it just has the numbers in the end, if you copy and paste the numbers and put it into 
a search bar in Google or um, Firefox or whatever browser you're using, this article will come up no matter what. Okay. If you want more information on DOIs, we do have we have created a libguide for that as well. Um, it goes more into depth about what a DOI is, why do you need it, who can get it, and where you can get it as well. Okay. So I'll just give you some time if you wanted to use the QR code or copy and paste the libguide. The next thing is in your promoting era of strategic publishing is reaching different audiences. And as a researcher, you want to make sure that your researcher is reaching different audiences, that different people are reading it and you know it's making an impact. So this is a spring onion. Um, I thought it used, I thought it was a leak, but <laughs> oh well. Um, to be a successful academic, you need to be able to pitch to different audiences and, you know, what are the broader implications of society, policy, commercial and educational, all those outcomes that come from your research. So you need to be able to write for different audiences, okay? So that's your research and those are all the different ways you can talk about your research, whether it be in a conference, if it's, you know, if you're in the media, if you're in an academic journal and the professional networks, you would talk and write about your research in different ways. Okay. For example, here is another um, article, Medical Student Education in the Times of COVID-19. A lot of COVID-19 articles are great for outmetrics because people do mention them and it's been relevant in the past two years. And you can see in which news articles it's been mentioned in. Um, you can, as long as a DOI is mentioned, this will be, um, this, it will go towards your altmetric score over here, okay? And Twitter as well. You can promote your research via Twitter and be like, hey, look at this amazing, you know, research that I've done. Just make sure you attach your DOI to it and people can retweet it and, you know, get the conversation started. So that is a way to make sure, that is a way to make sure that your outmetric score goes higher as well. And by publishing strategically in places, this would also increase it as well. Oop, lost my mouse there for a moment. And that's the end of our outreach section. Do we have any questions? All right, so moving on is to our measure bit. Um, I'm not gonna go too in depth with this, as I've mentioned before, only because we do have another session on measuring your research outcome, but we will also talk about it briefly a little bit. So let's have a look at this. So here is an article that I found. Okay. The first one is a citation-based measure, which is evidence for your research has academic impact. These are easily tracked through citation numbers and percentiles, which give you an impression of context and magnitude of um, achievement right here on this side, okay? Citation metrics takes time to mature once you publish. You won't be seeing citations until a long time after, okay? It, it does take some time, unless it's something absolutely, absolutely mind-blowing, it's going to take some time. Okay. And the second one is engagement, is your measure of success. So out metric right here. And it often leads to societal impact of your research. And like I said, we can measure this through out metric where they use a DOI right here. Okay. For example, you can see that this article has been mentioned in three policy documents, okay, 24 news outlets, and it's even been used in Wikipedia. 
These measures are immediate, but they often require some detective work to examine the context and then prepare a narrative about the kind of impact it has. Okay, so if you are applying for any kind of grant or promotion or even trying to pitch to industry, you have to examine the context and write the story for your research. For example, it doesn't really say much if you say you've been cited in Wikipedia, but you can go in and say that um, your research contributes to a societal understanding of this phenomenon, okay? Your research is being explained to the masses, to people that aren't in academia, that don't understand um, the, uh, whether it be like scientific jargon or any kind of, uh, you know, social science study. So by having your work cited in Wikipedia, it's a good thing because it means that normal people can understand it. Okay. But the common thread to linking the ability to track all these achievements are DOIs and orchids. Okay. Right here. Okay. When you get to the stage, you can contact a librarian for um, assistance. But an important thing to point out is what underpins the ability to track these kinds of measures is, I will stress, a DOI and an ORCID. They are the common thread running behind all the data when you get to this evidence gathering stage. And you will be grateful to your past self for having the foresights to get to use them, okay? So just make sure you get your ORCID and when you do publish, get a DOI for any kind of um, research output, okay? In summary, for your publication stage, you found your ORCID number, but none of your research is linked on it. You will have to add that yourself, Alison. Okay. Um, I will give you some contact details at the end of this presentation. And if you want to contact a librarian to help you out, um, you can, okay? So in summary, for your publication stage, you publish in the highest impact journal you can for your discipline or topic. Look at ways to make your work open access to maximize research and make sure key databases index your journal. Okay, this will impact your outreach as well. You sign up for ORCID to ensure accurate metrics to capture the engagement of your research. And you also have to assess it in for your academic and societal impact as well. We have created a research support guide, which explains everything that I've just talked about in more depth. It's got some interactive videos on it and some cool um, H5P things that you can click on and um, play around with. Um, do visit it. It's, um, it's within the library website and it is a work in progress as well. So we are constantly updating it with new information, with more um, and information that can be better explained as well. So it will be there. Up next is the traditional and emerging metrics. And there's the event room. You can also open it up in the, in, in the QR code. I'll give you like a few seconds to do that if you would like. And I'm sure Crystal has put it into the chat as well at the beginning of the session. We also have more workshops coming up on Monday, the 8th of August this year. It is another strategic publishing workshop and another traditional emerging metrics workshop in our um, library calendar. Please encourage your friends and fellow researchers to do uh, sign up for them and turn up. We would love to have you all here with us. And if you ever need to get in touch and you have more questions and you need some help with your research profiles and understanding our metric a little bit more and, you know, what a Q1 journal is, just um, we're only a phone call away. You can always email askthelibrary at cdu.edu.au. Um, that is possibly the best way to get in touch with us by email. And we have a fantastic team of librarians that can always help you out, okay? And yeah, that's, that's it for today. That's all I've got. If you do have any questions, feel free to use the chat, use your mic. Um, we did finish 10 minutes early. So if you would like to ask questions, go ahead.
No problem. I hope you enjoyed that. I'm going to stop the share right now. And I'm also going to stop recording.